Welcome to Central Presbyterian Church. I am your host for this service, Ruling Elder Zach Cosner. Uh, the link to the bulletin for this service is uh, can be found in the chat on our Facebook page, or if you go to our website, www.centralprespb.com. Uh, I'm going to ask um, everyone to pay attention to these few announcements. Um, due to the lockdown at Trinity Village, the style show has been postponed till a later date. Trinity Village will notify us when it has been rescheduled. Uh, and you can also follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, look for the username Central Prez PB. Um, the session has not made a decision on upcoming worship services. Uh, follow us on our social media channels as we make uh, decisions about uh, future worship services and how we're going to handle the um, current um, situation. Uh, we do thank you for joining us today. I will also mention that uh, we do a lot of call and response uh, prayers during our worship service. Um, that makes it a little difficult uh, to convey via this kind of uh, worship service where I will be reading uh, the entire uh, prayer. Um, but again, if you have that bulletin that you can find on our website or in the chat, um, you should be able to follow along rather easily. Uh, let us prepare to uh, worship God. Let's start with the uh, call to worship. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and that you have no money. Come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for which does not, it, excuse me, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish what which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Let us worship God. Now we will start the call to confession. If we claim that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sins to God, first using the prayer printed in the bulletin and then silently. God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. Return to us, us to paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. As people born of water and the Spirit, we have died to the old life, and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. <clears throat> Today's first scripture reading is from John chapter 4, verses 4 through 42. Listen for the word of the Lord. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, 
near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that it is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flock drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty, and the water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I might never be thirsty, or have to keep coming there to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you say that the place where you people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You will worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Then his disciples came. When they were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want? Or, Why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and complete his work. Do you not say, Four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see the fields that are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For there, there, for here the saying holds true, One sows and another reaps. I sent you the reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I had ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him, and he stayed there for two days and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear. In hearing we might believe, and believing we might live lives richer and fuller in service to you, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. 
This sermon was prepared for us today by Reverend Tim Reeves, who is uh, usually filling our pulpit um, with the circumstances as they are. Uh, he uh, was able to send me this sermon and asked me to deliver it today. Um, so let us begin. In Nicholas Evans' popular novel, the novel, The Horse Whisperer, Annie Graves travels across the continent with her daughter, Grace, and Grace's severely traumatized horse, Pilgrim, in a desperate attempt to convince a Montana rancher named Tom Booker to help them. A friend had told Annie that Booker was one of that elite group of people with the ability to heal injured horses. Nicholas Evans described this elite group of people this way. They could see into the creature's soul and soothe the wounds they found there. Often they were seen as witches, and perhaps they were. Some wrought their magic with the bleached bones of toads plucked from moonlit streams. Others, it was said, could, with but a glance, root the hooves of a working team to the earth they plowed. For secrets uttered softly into pricked and troubled ears, the men were known as whisperers. In addition to the challenge of calming, pro calming Pilgrim, who had been severely injured in a gruesome riding accident, Booker soon discovers that he has two human souls to heal as well. Grace has blocked out all memory of the terrible accident in which her dearest friend was killed, and she herself lost a leg. Maimed for life, she turned her fear and angered inward, blocking anyone's attempt to help get her on, get on ugh, blocking anyone's attempt to help her get on with life. Meanwhile, her mother Annie, a high-rolling advertising executive, has alienated herself from both her husband and her daughters for years as suddenly has been forced to come face to face with what she has sacrificed in pursuit of her career. Grace's physical and emotional injuries following her accident mirror Annie's inner alienation from herself and her family. Indeed, Annie has lost the ability to give or receive human affection. It is a story about a woman and her daughter's search for healing for a wounded animal, but who end up finding themselves healed in ways they were not expecting. Often, I believe that is the case in Scripture when someone encounters the love and grace of God. As we read the Gospel accounts, we hear stories about Jesus encountering peoples whose lives have been broken and shattered by circumstances and events. And they come from every walk of life, be it a poor widow grieving over the death of her son or a rich young man who had everything. Jesus saw brokenness in both the self-righteous zeal of the respectable religious and the self-loathing of dis disreputable prostitutes. He knew that the robes of wealth hid hearts just as broken as the heart of a raving, naked, demon-possessed man. In their own ways, everyone Jesus encountered was broken, empty, searching, or thirsting after something or someone they could only at best describe in the vaguest of terms. But that longing was summed up beautifully in the words of the psalmist. As a deer longs for the flooring streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, where is your God? The message of the gospel is that in Jesus Christ, God, has come to quench this thirst for God because he alone can give us the living water. This week's reading from John's Gospel is a beautiful testimony of how wounds and divisions, even those that are long-standing, can be healed. Jesus is a healer, is, th is this morning's reading, but in ways that may not be obvious at first glance. To borrow the imagery of Nicholas Evans, Jesus is portrayed as a soul whisperer in his encounter with a Samaritan woman. <coughs> Excuse me. It is truly a wonderful story of healing and restoration. It is a lesson of how the grace and love of God transcends all boundaries, all enmity, and all barriers that we humans all too often erect to keep others at arm's length. And it all begins with seven little words, but he had to go through Samaria. A, little, a more literal translation of the Greek would be that it was necessary for him to go through Samaria. What is truly interesting about that verse, however, was the fact that no self-respecting, God-fearing Jew would ever feel it necessary to go through Samaria. Samaria was to be avoided, 
even if traveling through that region were in fact the most direct route, route through points A and B. Think about that. One would go out of one's way just to avoid treading on Sumerian soil. Why? The breach between the Jews and the Samaritans can be traced to the Assyrian occupation of North Palestine in 721 BC, but the most intense rivalry began about 200 BC. The source of the, uh, the anatomy between Jews and Samaritans was a dispute about the correct location of the, uh, the cultic religious center. The Samaritans built a shrine on the Mount uh, Gerizim during the Persian period and claimed that this shrine, not the Jerusalem temple, was the proper place of worship. The shrine at Mount Gerizim was destroyed by Jewish troops in 128 BC. Animosity between the two groups existed even in Jesus' day. Hence, the Samaritan woman Jesus encountered at Jacob's well was truly astonished that Jesus asked her for a drink of water. How is it that you, a Jew, ask me, a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Hence, John's understanded, understated editorial comment as well. Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. But Jesus, we are told, had to go through Samaria. Moreover, it seems quite apparent that the reason it was necessary for him to go through Samaria was to offer living water first to this woman he encountered, and then to the others in Samaria as well. In so doing, Jesus exhibited a profound truth that still makes some in the Church of Jesus Christ uncomfortable. The grace and love of God are extended to everyone, even, the, even and most especially to those we would seek to exclude. It is because of this profound truth that Jesus would call his followers to love their enemies and pray for those who persecute them. It is because of this profound truth that we place so much emphasis on forgiveness. Moreover, it is only this profound truth that makes forgiveness possible. The word who became flesh and lived among us came to reconcile us to God so that we might also be reconciled to one another. Thus Paul could write to the church in Rome, For while we are still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that, while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. And to the, Christian, to the Christians in Corinth, Paul would write, if so anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So then, in Jesus' encounters with, God, with the Samaritan woman, excuse me, let me say that again. So then, in Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman, he was showing the word indeed that in God's realm, there is no room for the distinctions that so often divide us. All are welcomed as beloved children in the household and family of God. Early in his ministry, Jesus the soul whisperer was already going about the business of healing this sin-sick creation in ways we could not even imagine. I believe it was Augustine who once said that something along the lines that Jesus loved everybody he ever met as if that one were the only person in the world. He loved us all as he loved each. Every person who looked into the eyes of Jesus found an affection looking back at them which said in powerful ways, what happens to you makes a difference to me. Were I to sum up Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, I would begin by saying that Jesus was telling her that what happens to her makes a difference to him. Her joys and sorrows, her triumphs and tribulations, and every single moment in between matter to God. And the same can be said about us. We are all, in essence, this Samaritan woman, and thankfully our Lord felt it necessary, our Lord felt it was necessary to pass through Samaria. Of course, Many of us are likely scandalized to hear that we are this Samaritan woman, Samaritan woman because the Church of Jesus Christ has spent thousands of years distancing itself from her. Fred Craddock writes, 
The account of Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well is difficult to read because most of us have been suggest, subjected to highly imaginative and biblical, biblically unwarranted portraits of her which distort our understanding. Evangelists of plenty have assumed that the brighter her nails, the darker her mascara, and the shorter her skirt, the greater the testimony to the power of the converting word. In other words, this woman is often portrayed as a woman with little or no moral fiber. The problem with such an interpretation is that there is absolutely no justification for it in the Bible. Note that Jesus never labels her a sinner. Note that there is no mention anywhere of her need to repent. In truth, I believe that this woman's overarching problem was one of grief, not guilt. If this woman had had five husbands and now had none, then it meant that either five husbands had died, or that five men had married her and then abandoned her in divorce, or in any number of different combinations of the two. We must remember that in culture, women could never have gotten a divorce. In, excuse me, let me say that again. We must remember that, it, that in that culture, women could have never gotten a divorce. And so to illustrate the living water of healing and reconciliation that Jesus was offering, he began to show real compassion, which said in no uncertain terms that this woman mattered to him. That may not seem like a very big deal to any who know what it is to like to be loved, but to someone whose soul was perhaps as wounded beyond imagination and whose soul was more parched than any desert and who like a deer longing for flowing streams long for God. We know that the experience of wholeness and abundant life offered by Jesus was a very big deal. How do we know? She couldn't contain herself. She went to her village and sought to bring others to Jesus. She becomes one of the earliest evangelists, inviting others to come and see Jesus. Astute readers of John will note that the invitation to come and see had been extended by Jesus to his first disciples and was also the invitation that Philip issued to Nathaniel in recruiting him to become a disciple as well. In the mouth of the Samaritan woman, the words, come and see, become a rallying cry for all those who are troubled souls long, who long for healing. Come and see becomes the message of those who know what it means to be lifted up instead of downtrodden. Excuse me. Come and see becomes the message of those who know what it means to be lifted up instead of downtrodden, to be embraced instead of pushed away, to be loved instead of ignored. Come and see becomes the invitation for others to receive the same living water offered to us. Come and see brings all parched and weary souls into the presence of the soul whisperer who question, quenches our deepest thirst and longing. And so it was that many other Samaritans came to believe in Jesus and asked him to stay with them. And so it was that in experiencing the grace and love of God, they recognized Jesus as the savior of the world. Today, the love and grace of our Lord is still being offered to all of us. The Lord still offers the living water to souls that are parched. The Lord of all creation still offers reconciliation and wholeness. And if we listen closely, we may just hear the soul whisper saying, come and see, come and see, come and see. After all, it is still necessary that our Lord pass through Samaria today. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. Let me find... I would ask now at this time that you would please uh, please join me to confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> Uh, 
Uh, usually at this point in the service, we would uh, ask everyone for their uh, tithes and offerings, um, but we currently do not have an online giving platform, so I will ask you at this time to take a moment uh, during your week um, if you are uh, out and about um, instead of um, trying to stay home, which is what I recommend highly that everyone stay home if possible. Um, please uh, make sure you uh, go by and patronize your local um, small businesses and um, local cafes and restaurants, especially get to go orders. But uh, please remember to tip generously and um, be uh, help those out who are going to be affected by this um, short period of time of, of um, quarantining and um, everyone staying at home. And as with always, we, uh, we need to thank God for our uh, gifts, so please join me for the prayer of thanksgiving. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasure, and indeed our very selves for you to use as you see fit. Until that most glorious day when at the name of Jesus, Every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend, and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. Uh, for now, we're going to um, let us share our joys and concerns, if there are any. Um, if you are in the chat on Facebook, uh, feel free to go ahead and um, put your prayer concerns in the chat. Um, I know, of course, we want to go ahead and keep the um, all of our healthcare workers in uh, your prayers. Um, all those who are currently uh, sick with the coronavirus, uh, we want to keep them in our prayers. Uh, I have been asked to uh, pray for uh, Brad Von Tunglin, who is going to be having some, um, his first infusion will be on Monday morning. Um, please keep the residents of Trinity Village um, uh, uh, retirement community, who, which are which is located right behind our campus, um, in your prayers. They are on lockdown. Um, several of our members are currently um, in that uh, facility. Um, please keep um, the uh, David and Karen Purdue in your prayers and Jimmy Mosley in your prayers. Uh, we ask that you pray for. Um, Mr. Walter Collins as well. Uh, we ask that you pray for uh, Laura Cosner as well. And there's also a list of prayer concerns that can be found in the bulletin on our website. Uh, that will be at www.centralprespp.com. Uh, please continue to pray for our uh, daycare workers who are going to be dealing with an overflow of children, uh, those who are open um, from the, uh, because the schools are being closed. Uh, please pray for the schools and uh, pray that the uh, spread of the coronavirus slows. Um, I'm going to give a minute, one more minute to the chat. I'm not seeing anything there. Uh, so uh, let us pray. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. Please hold up all those we mentioned uh, a moment ago in, in, in your care. Uh, please bless the healthcare workers and um, please, um, please bless the scientists and those working on a vaccine. And uh, please bless us as we go through these troubled times. Uh, give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, who taught us pr to pray together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, usually we would have a hymn at this point, but since we don't have any music for the service, I will just say, um, please uh, take precautions, take care of yourselves. Um, if you would like to uh, share this uh, sermon that uh, we uh, delivered today, uh, you can go to our website, again, www.centralprespb.com, where we uh, weekly put out a podcast that is the sermon that is delivered each Sunday morning. So you can uh, share it with your friends uh, or listen again if you feel uh, so inclined. Uh, and uh, this video will be available on the Facebook page uh, for the next week or so. And uh, we appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedule today to uh, join us for this worship service. Now go out into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit, taking today's message with you, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Thanks for joining us.